All right. So we're an intimate group this afternoon. Wonderful. Um, hi. Can everyone hear me? I, c I, can, I can hear myself in echo. This is slightly strange. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to be here this afternoon. Maybe some of you just want to rest your weary legs, having gone through the fair. Some of you, I hope, will be here to listen to what we have to say. I'm uh, delighted to be joined on stage by um, Chloe G. Matthews and Paula Mee, two wonderful artists that I've had the real pleasure of working with over the last year. Uh, Chloe Jew Matthews is a British-based artist working across photography and film. Um, dare I say activist as well? We can talk about that later, or artivist. Um, Chloe's been making work that has a really strong connection to thinking through the landscape, time, ecologies, the representation of landscape um, through various bodies of work, including Thames Log, um, In Search of Frankenstein, Caspian the Elements, which we're going to see later, which is included in the exhibition Resistors, a Lens on Gender and Ecology, which is open at the Barbican Art Gallery, and with the, that's really the context of this, this conversation. Um, and is also very excitingly making a new work um, as a commission with the FRAC in Aquitaine um, called Landis, and maybe we'll see a little bit of an excerpt. Can you hear me? Because it is very loud. Oh, okay, super. And then we're also joined on stage, and I have the pleasure of having done a few talks now with Polomi. Polomi Basu is an, an Indian artist based now just outside of London. Um, I would definitely say, I mean, both of you have a, a connection in terms of you're both artists working in photography and very much in film and really thinking through ideas of, of our relationship to, to kind of... Well, representational justice, but also land justice and equality and, and um, equity. But uh, Polomi's work, um, we're showing Centralia in the show. We're going to see that in a little bit. Um, but, but um, yeah, Polomi's been really dedicated, I think, to kind of thinking through um, questions of gender justice and have devoted your kind of career to documenting um, women um, in, in the global south, marginalized women through various bodies of work, Blood Speaks, Centralia, um, Fireflies, Sisters of the Moon, possibly my favorite title in the world ever. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of introduction and I'm Alona Pardo, a curator at the Barbican Art Gallery and I am the curator of this exhibition, Resistors, A Lens of Gender and Ecology, which presumably many of you haven't seen. Um, so you're going to indulge me a little bit as I give a little brief introduction to the show. And I also want to take this a few minutes as well to think through what do we mean by ecofeminism? Because when I came across ecofeminism, I kind of stumbled upon it accidentally. And of course, it struck me that these two struggles should be into, they were, they were inevitably intertwined, but it, I hadn't put these two struggles together. And, and so I want to really kind of unpack a little bit about what it means and then think through how, it, in, how both Polomy and, and Chloe's work really talks to those ideas. So, so the show is, um, it's a survey really of the relationship between, I'm gonna put my glasses on because I'm gonna read a bit. Um, a relationship between gender and ecology. And it really is trying to kind of identify the systemic links between the oppression of women, black, trans, and indigenous communities, and the degradation of the planet. And, it, and it's really, I think, very timely. You know, we're at a moment where gendered bodies, colonized bodies are really kind of being transformed under the stresses and strains of planetary toxicity, rampant deforestation, species extinction, privatization of our commonwealth, something really important to me, and the colonization of our deep seas by this kind of industrial, nuclear, military, agricultural, corporate complex, um, which is kind of really steeped in, in ideas of the patriarchy and a kind of capitalist, masculinist economy. So at its heart, Resistors is really an attempt, I think, to, to shine a light on these activities um, by thinking through how artists Women and gender non-conforming artists are really recognizing their planetary interconnectedness and non-separability. And I just want to stress here also that I'm using the term woman in a very maximalist sense. And by that I mean, you know, we're including all individuals who identify as such, um, irrespective of their assigned gender. And that is really important. And it, 
And I'm just going to quote the feminist writer Lola Olofemi, who wrote brilliantly, Woman is a strategic coalition, an umbrella under which we gather in order to make political demands. In a liberated future, it might not exist at all. Um, Paul and me and Chloe have heard me say this before, but I really look forward to that future. So the show is organized thematically. I'm not going to talk to you, but it's really kind of trying, as I said, to make these links between environmental and gender justice, thinking through how they are in, you can't, can't extract them from our kind of global struggles of, and the power structures that kind of really threaten our, our um, ecosphere. And the show we're going to see brings together, you know, film, photography, photo performance, performance work. Um, but just to say that the show, um, yeah, it's bringing together different aesthetic strategies, kind of thinking through how a woman-centered vision of nature has really been replaced by a mechanistic patriarchal order um, organized around the exploitation of natural resources, which is something that I think Chloe and, and both of your work, Centralia, is really, really kind of, you know, prizes apart. Um, and so just very briefly, um, ecofeminism is a kind of school of thought that emerged in the 70s and 80s, and it really joined the dots between the intertwined oppressions of sexism, racism, colonialism, capitalism, kind of all shaped and contoured by a very Western relationship to science. Um, and so ecofeminist scholars have long argued and critiqued the feminized constructions of nature while also challenging kind of patriarchal and colonial abuses against our planet, women and marginalized communities. And increasingly, and this is where the show I think really has kind of cachet, feminist theorists recognize that there can be no gender justice without environmental justice. And so ecofeminism is really being kind of reclaimed as a unifying platform against that all women most importantly, all women can rally behind. Um, so I think, is that a, I think that's a good introduction. So as I said, ecofeminism is a kind of a critical theoretical lens um, that focuses on the many ways that gender as a kind of construct shapes how people see and treat nature as well as people's kind of interactions with their environment. And so I guess my first question, maybe to, to Chloe first, is, is to what degree were you aware? I mean, what was your motivation when you started to make Caspi and the Elements? Oh, I need to press. There we go. To, to, and, and, and were you aware of ecofeminism? Is this something that, that came to you after you made the work? Because women play such a central role, and we're going to show some of the images. Yeah, I, um, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I think... Certainly, I was making Caspian series between 2010 and 2015, and at that time, I wasn't aware of the term. Um, and, you know, the body of work came about through me looking at materials and thinking about the elements, as I call them, in the area, thinking about oil, gas, uranium, salt, water, and using these kind of elements or materials as my guides through the region to find interesting stories. So it was almost using these kind of... Um, geological materials as the thread um, to take me um, to, to all sorts of places around the Caspian Sea. So it's from Azerbaijan to Iran to Russia to Kazakhstan, etc. cetera. And, um, and as I say, it was really about... Um, Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm the... I think there's a technical glitch, so excuse should us. We just have it, should we have it on, um, on autoplay on or, or can you keep going I through? I don't know. It's not working. Well, we'll see what happens. But so um, I think for this series, although I wasn't thinking about um, searching out female stories, many just kind of erupted in, this, in the process of, of, of looking for human stories that were, were connected by these, by these materials. So for example, some of the first, the first photographs you saw was a woman bathing in crude oil as a health remedy. Um, you know, I was interested to try and find these kind of counter narratives about how people were engaging with this mineral resource, which normally we think about in connection with, um, you know, heavy industry, pollution, um, corruption, mass wealth. Um, but in fact, seeing someone using it as a healing um, material, it's being used here for, for issues with bone and skin disorders. So almost looking right back to the beginnings of what oil um, was and could have been. It's in fact talked about in Marco Polo's diaries that, um, that um, 
uh, camels were bathed in crude oil as a health remedy. So it's kind of trying to take away from this, from this industrialized idea of what crude oil has been and perhaps connect with something deeper, earlier, more essential about the human connection to landscape. I mean, that came land. across really strongly and I, I love that idea and I, it, and I hopefully we can, I'm, I'm clearly not a tech <laughs> wizard. Oh, voila, okay. Because what, what struck me about Caspian, the elements in particular, is exactly this, that we have a relationship to natural resources and wealth that it, since the kind of, um, kind of industrial age is very much seen as a resource, as something that we extract, we exploit. But actually what's so beautiful in you know, this work and in other works, if I can get there, because clearly this isn't working, is, is how these natural resources really shaped cultures, how they shape mythologies and folklores and traditions. And there is a completely kind of, yeah, a different way of having a different relationship. And it, I think that's absolutely critical to ecofeminism because it's really trying to find our way outside of this kind of capitalist model and go back to something maybe that's either you know old or even maybe perhaps I don't want to use the word technological because I don't believe that but um but sorry I'm I'm not this isn't working for me clearly anybody do you want to have a go and see if that's oh have you got <laughs> oh dear pressing straight in the that one yeah Again. All right. Oh, voila, okay. okay. Um, and so perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about this image, just because I think yeah. people, d uh, yeah. Well, I think Wait. also, you know, there's this question of old ways, new ways. What are people doing in contemporary life that kind of engages? As you can see here, this is a, um, this is a woman who is... Well, you probably can't see, but um, I can tell you she's at the end of a kind of ritual that she's, she's conducting with this, um, these petroglyphs in Azerbaijan. It's an um, ancient site um, where she has travelled from the city. So she's a you know, 30, 40-year-old woman who has a pretty kind of cosmopolitan life or a sort of urban life, certainly. Um, but she sees herself as a transpersonal therapist. And so she goes to these sites of kind of ancient... Um, you know, here the petroglyphs to perform these to perform these rituals in in the landscape. So she also talks. You saw probably the one before. Was it? There's these mud volcanoes. Yeah. She talks about these as 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 nature's orgasm. So she also goes to do these rituals um, in uh, by these mud volcanoes in Azerbaijan. So it's for me, it was searching out these these stories, which of course are not kind of mainstream mainstream stories of what the majority of um, you know Baku are doing, but almost by finding these stories, also. Um, these women here who in Sufi practices are, are kind of caressing the limestone. So there's almost a kind of spiritual relationship um, to, the, to the rock um, that, it, that um, has been used to build these, um, these shrines. Many of them are, are in fact built within um, big rocky outcrops or mountains. So again, seeing how people are engaging with, with the rock, the land, in, in this case, spiritual religious, mystical practices. In the series, there's also much more practical or artistic, all sorts of um, kinds of relationships with, with these natural resources. And I should just add that, you know, part of the reason we don't know about ecofeminism is because there was an absolute flight from nature. You know, this idea that, um, you know, feminist theorists, in, particularly in the 80s, you know, were absolutely terrified of, of the woman's body being reassociated or affiliated with nature because they've both been dominated and they thought it would kind of regress the women's lib movement. But, and, Yes, and so particularly in the West, I should say, of course, because as we'll get on to see uh, with Polomy's work, it's a very different conversation and a very different relationship with um, ecofeminism. But ecofeminism is something that was really relegated to the footnotes of kind of second wave, third wave feminism because they were terrified that it would reinforce, you know, women's kind of reprodu you know, kind of position as a kind of reproductive body. Um, but I'm just going to, here, these are just a few shots. But I'm just going to maybe perhaps talk a little bit about Polomy's work. We'll have to get going back and forth. But Polomy, maybe you could... No, I think... Um, but I think it'll be, we should yeah. go back and forth. Let's go back and forth. Um, 
But Polomi, maybe you could just introduce us to um, your epic work, Centralia. Um, as I said earlier, you've really dedicated a lot of your life to, to thinking through how to represent, or to questions of real gender justice. And particularly for me, this work, Centralia, which is such a complex body of work that tells this incredible story of these Naxalite women. But really, it's a story of, of gender violence or gender-based violence on women's bodies and on the land. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how you came to make the work, what your relationship with the women were, was, and a little bit about those women and the kind of the physical risks that they take to fight these injustices and these struggles, both for the land and for their kind of the, the, the survival, their, own, their very own survival, I guess. Uh, hi. So, um, Centralia, for those of you who don't know, it's, um, it's, uh, the work is focused around the forest areas of um, central India, uh, along the states of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Odisha, with the ground zero of uh, insurgency is in Chhattisgarh. And uh, for those of you who don't know, like the work, uh, I mean, the work is obviously about the sort of exploitation of the land and the mining and all of that, you know, that goes with sort of uh, um, displacing indigenous communities. But also there is a political, uh, ideological movement that started in my home state in West Bengal in Calcutta. And the grounds, the epicenter of the violence um, was in my neighborhood in College Street, where the violence blew up and my father was one of the Maoist uh, protesters. But it was a more ideological movement before it became a militarized movement and moved to sort of central India and became a sort of a, a struggle for the indigenous people and uh, their land. But, um, but what's special about this is also that um, 90, about 65% of um, the uh, uh, resurrection of uh, sort of the uh, militia of the guerrilla is our uh, are women and they're Adivasi women, which means they're low caste Dalit women who are living in the forests and um, and also they are the 90% of the martyrs, you know, so uh, for me it was incredible that, you know, I mean you had a full like deep, uh, like a proper militia where like, you know, where in, a, in, a in, in many ways in a primitive way where it was like slightly more like uh, egalitarian than like, you know, what we, when in, in, in a deeply misogynistic, exclusively male space in India where we like, you know, in largely grew up. So I guess, um, I mean, it's, it's a well-known fact that, you know, the, for, for the women in, uh, in, in the uh, People's Liberation Guerrilla Army, I mean, specifically it's like the territoriality of the body and the land it matters, you know? So for, 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 for an indigenous uh, person, you know, it's like the rape of the land and the rape of the body are connected. And it's not just for indigenous. If you look at the history of violence, of um, sort of conquering and uh, getting into other countries, it's always come with like conquering of lands, have always come with raping and like exploiting the feminine body, you know, and the feminine identifying body. But it, it, it's like, uh, so for me, I feel like they're kind of connected, you know, like women have always been like, on the front line and the guidance of nature, like not only how their bodies shape like nature and, you know, again, coming back to nature culture, but there, we can talk about that later, but, you know, so it is a part of their thing, you know, the everyday sort of organizing way, it's an everyday organizing for them to like protect and defend their land, you know? So when that's under attack and, you know, and it's like when occupation of any sort of, uh, land begins, violence comes with it, you know, whether that's like um, occupation of um, uh, uh, in Chhattisgarh in India or that's like, you know, in Palestine. And then when, you know, when there's no room left to breathe, you know, that's when you revolt and resist, you know. I mean, for me, that's important because I've, I, when I was interviewed by Women's Hour and BBC, they were referring to the women as terrorists with me, you know, but I was like, it's again that fine line who has the right to resist when you resist and when you revolt and you know violence begins the minute occupation begins so like it, it's it's complicated and it's like so for me it was extremely important to have this sort of work you know because um not only was i documenting the women who are like wanting to sort of destroy the state but also i was working with to conquer her land and the borders of the women who were protecting uh, the borders from uh, in the front line of uh, sort of uh, India Pakistan. So it was just miraculous ways of seeing how women, when pushed to extremity, uh, challenge their own roles in society. You know, and they 
become these like you know force, uh, forces to reckoning reckon with whether that's like constructive or destructive in many ways and there's no one way to like uh, defend or resist there are many ways and which comes through very well in our exhibition in our room that you put together like we see many forms of resistance happening the nonviolent the violent but is you know and I yeah. was about to say so the show we have 48 women artists plus collectives and if this is the one body of work where we see armed resistance you know, there are a lot of bodies of work that are thinking through kind of creative acts of civil disobedience they are nonviolent tactics um, and this is, it, it, it is so marked because women are so often associated with a different form of resistance. Um, and I think it's incredible to see these women take up arms. It's incredibly empowering, even though they are, and they're doing it for very complicated reasons. Um, but, but, but I do want to talk also a little bit about, and I think this comes out in both of the works, but... With it, for me, Silvia Federici has been a real touch point for thinking through the show and her kind of ideas of kind of joyful militancy in relationship to feminism. And I just wondered whether you could talk a little bit about how that might come out, because it's difficult to think through what joyful militancy might mean in a violent space. And, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, the, how the women, you know, lived that experience. Um, I guess it's, if, firstly, I have to say that these women, a lot of these women I met were like, they've seen their houses burned down, their families destroyed, they've been raped with no grass left on the floor. A lot of them didn't have choice, but they had to pick up arms to resist. As I said, when you no longer can breathe, it's when you decide to, you know, uh, fight, you know? So, um, I guess for me, I mean, it's important to, recognize that joy in the context what I'm to we're discussing here is not an emotion we're talking to about. Yes. We're talking about joy as a, as a, as this sort of space, you know, where you can uh, uh, form kinships, where you can form solidarity, where you can defend together, where you can resist together. And then when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, and, and then think about being militant about whether that's breaking down about your shared tra about whether that's about trauma breaking down shame or is that about throwing the empire out of our lives and like you know i mean it's all of those dominations of uh, destructing the those domin uh, the, those structures of domination and uh, the empire you know and how we what, how we do and what kind of space we want to be in which we are not only like um, where joy is not, a, you know, a happiness as such, but we become in a space we are constantly like animating and staying in action while at the same time we are, you know, building kinships and we are forming solidarity and we are creating sort of um, an experimental, like uh, curious sort of uh, space where we are organizing in an everyday way, you know? And I guess it's not just about the work, it's also largely in most of my artistic practice where the activism and the work actually mirrors each other. But it's like important for me like to understand that it's an everyday way of my life that I have to organize and stay in that sort of praxis, you know, rather than an act, I just rock up to support when Palestine is burning, you know? But that is also important because it's really important you do, but you have to understand that organization and activism needs to happen on an everyday basis. It's our everyday desire to resist, to persist, to defend, to like, you know, form, shared solidarities it's an everyday act and maybe that comes across because i'm an artist from the global south and i have grown up where i've had to do this from the time before i was even born you know in my mother's womb like she was already resisting and fighting for me to be born out as a woman you know so it's like i don't know if it's in my dna but it's something not only we do that ourselves and then we empower others to do that and so we're we are building momentum and we are building sort of you know sorry i've spoken a lot no, 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 it's fantastic, but it segues brilliantly. <laughs> but I think it segues absolutely brilliantly, actually, into um, a body of work by Chloe, which is called In Search of Frankenstein, which was inspired, which was a, a book you've made, a project that you've made on residency in Switzerland, inspired by Mary Shelley's 
a Frankenstein book, which she wrote while on a residency, no, whilst on holiday with her partner, Lord Byron, this kind of, this, um, this also quite a macho moment where there's Lord Byron sets these kind of, you know, historical figures, a, a moment to, to write this story and she outshines them completely, which is kind of incredible. But again, you know, Mary Shelley has her own history of resistance and, and a feminist lineage and about around through suffrage. And I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about, oh, wrong way, um, this body of work. Yeah, well, this, um, this, as you said, came out of an artist residency in Switzerland. And for me, it's often going to a place, a, a landscape, a location with not necessarily any prior knowledge about it, starting to look into the history, starting to think about events of the past to then inform kind of looking at, looking at the places around me. And so it was by coming across that story um, of Mary Shelley um, writing Frankenstein in, in Switzerland of all places. I didn't have a clue at the time, that's where she wrote it. And then looking at, you know, the themes of the novel, thinking about, um, you know, creating, uh, creating this monster, sort of the human, the human need to create, to push science further, ethics going out of the window, and pushing and pushing for more knowledge, technological advance, um, at the expense of what? And I suppose, I took my, you know, old copy of Frankenstein with me when I was in these mountains, not sure if I would find any connections, but suddenly in that environment it felt so clear to me that I was looking at these kind of impoverished uh, landscapes, these um, glaciers that were melting, um, these, yeah, the, the, these very, you know, beautiful, currently um, snowy landscapes that, as we know, are, are kind of deteriorating um, at, breakneck speed and so to suddenly see that in fact this was this was the Frankenstein this was the monster um, that we're living with um, amongst um, that you know is out of the bag you know and it, and it and has its own energy and kind of um, um, journey now that we're not in control of and so then also i I came across all of these bunkers the bunkers that were made um, in um, you know, the 50s and 60s for um, in case of nuclear disaster. So, in fact, the nuclear bomb, again, fame, felt to me like another of these examples of, of humankind creating something so powerful and so destructive that, in fact, then you have to build a whole set um, infrastructure to protect yourself from that thing which you created. I mean, I've, it's funny. I've been looking at this body of work, I obviously, beyond the, con uh, with the context of where we are now, mm. and it's kind of incredible that Switzerland built this underground world, um, this kind of survive space of survival, and where we, yeah, I mean, it feels incredibly prescient to be looking at it again. Mm. Mm. Um, well, and, and these spaces are sort of maintained, so there's this strange idea of when will they be used, you know? What, and, and as with Frankenstein, it's come through, you know, 200 years worth of becoming relevant and used for all sorts of different, you know, um, current issue, issues of the time, you know, it's, it's repurposed again and again. I've per repurposed it for the, to think about climate change um, and, you know, and, and in this case the, with the nuclear bunkers, but, you know, others have used it throughout time to be, to re to be representative of other things, so... And so I guess the question therefore then takes us to what can be the relationship possibly between the practice of photography and ecological justice? Because even within that, there is a dialectical opposition in terms of photography being a kind of a project of colonialism, ultimately, but it also being a kind of a material object of colonial extraction. You know, photography has a materiality and objectness that is made through the extraction of natural resources and minerals. And I wonder whether each of you could pretend, it's something that I've been really grappling with, you know, as an exhibition maker, as a curator. How do we do shows that, that, that think through these ideas, not only conceptually, but also curatorially, you know, how do we make these things happen? They are really difficult conversations and, they, and it's not fair to only put the onus on the artist and how you make the work. But, but photography occupies this incredibly difficult space, as we all know, um, as being a colonial project. And, and I, you know, and I, yeah, I wonder whether perhaps, Polymy, you can talk a little about that, whether you've thought about that. Well, um, 
Uh, for me, I mean, personally, I felt I feel like I've always had a slightly more praxis-based approach rather than a material-based approach to my practice overall. Like, I've always had a very acti activistic practice, and then everything with the museum world and everything came much later in my life. But um, I mean, decolonizing uh, museums and uh, decolonial ecological sort of interventions in museums is a, another conversation, like a bigger conversation to have. But I, I, I certainly feel that having eco exhibitions are not going to save us, right? Like, I mean, but then w what is it that then you want to do? But the, so here's the important question that we are used to seeing environmental and ecological justice from a very technological, scientific point of view, you know? But it's important for us to then see it from a cultural domination, exploitation, a non-human nature sort of perspective, uh, something that where, my, where the, uh, the oppressed are included, you know, which is, again, bringing us back to uh, eco-feminism and de uh, decolonial sort of conversations. And, and, and that's where the thing, like, who are you including in the voice, in your shows, you know? And um, how are you making it a more praxis-based approach where radical ideas can then be animated and activated? You know, are you forming coalitions with your work so that, you know, it can be taken into other movements, you know? These are things I feel like, at least for me as a post-colonial artist, I've always felt the re responsibility that I have to have a very acti activation-oriented practice because I felt like I've, I've grown up seeing people parachute themselves into my part of the world and like, you know, and then what happens? Like, rather than a response to something, it has to be beyond that, you know? It's important to be curious uh, and responsive, but and but it's and it's and, and we need to be in that space where you're not in the binary of right and wrong. You're outside of the binaries of right and wrong, but you're also in a space where radical ideas can be turned into radical activations. You know, and I feel like we need more coalitions. We need more like uh, again coming back to joyful militancy and like you know, where we need a f more fierce commitment to uh, uh, the work we make, the people we make with, and how we can create a place of love and care coming from something that is largely destructive. But how do we then turn that into something that is like, you know, transformational and liberational and like more embodied? Okay, that's the best answer ever. Thank you. Um, I mean, the show, <laughs> the show is really trying to occupy a space that is this kind of I guess, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, pro-queer, feminist platform and be incredibly inclusive. Um, you know, and that really was, you know, in a way it's interesting thinking about ecofeminism and why it was so unfashionable in the 80s through to the 2000s because it wasn't intersectional. You know, it was really very largely coming from white women's voices and concerns as feminist practice very much was, or at least in terms of kind of feminist theory and discourse as written down in the kind of Northern European, well, North American European axis. So, you know, it's, so, so ecofeminism actually has a much longer history in somewhere like the Global South, and particularly in India, there is a very long history of kind of, rec they wouldn't call themselves eco-feminists, they wouldn't call themselves eco-warriors, and they wouldn't call themselves feminists, and neither proto. But there is a very, you know, a very strong lineage, I think, that you're coming from, one that comes outside, as you say, these kind of binary axes that we have in the West, which is the male-female mind-body nature culture one, which is what makes actually ecofeminism such an exciting kind of effervescent way of thinking because it, it, it positions itself absolutely as this kind of, uh, not only a rejection, but trying to find, I sound like a, a kind of a third way through, an alternative kind of way of looking and seeing. And, and you've talked a lot about, you know, healing in, in the, in, um, in the Caspian's project, this idea, you know, of, of and the thing is, it's difficult because, you know, there's a lot of, of, again, a lot of emphasis or exploitation potentially being put on indigenous kind of practices, you know, that they're going to have to carry a lot of the burden of how we find a way out of this kind of rut that we're in. Um, but yeah, thank you, Bonami, that was great. But I wonder whether you can say something, Chloe, about this photography as a kind of colonial project and its relationship to ecological justice. And I, I just say it because... If you haven't seen it already, there's this brilliant book that Chloe has just edited with towels over there um, and uh, by the eyes. But it really does try and unpack some of these conversations 
around what does it mean to do kind of sustainable photography in very much kind of pragmatic, practical terms, but also in, you know, as in conceptual terms, you know, so how do we find a way of talking about um, photography, not, you know, as a, as a colonial project and making the link representationally through those two things. And I wonder whether you can say a little bit about yeah, that. I, How, yeah, I think, yeah, in, 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 the, um, in the publication, we have, for example, a, a section which is about thinking practically, because I think so many of us can get so caught up with the conceptual approaches, what we're trying to talk about, what our agendas are, and kind of forget about the materiality and the toxicity of, of the, you know, um, things that we are using, the camera, computers, even the websites. I mean, um, the Sustainable Darkroom are a fascinating and fantastic organization in London, We're doing a lot of stuff around not only how to kind of use alternative processes in making photographs, so um, exploring all sorts of natural processes, uh, na natural um, materials that can be used um, in creating an image, but also thinking about, for example, solar powered websites. You know, as humans, we know everything we touch in some way we are kind of degrading the planet, which is a sort of horrific um, way to walk through each day, um, knowing that, you know, everything you, you, you drink from, you, you touch, the sort of, you know, everything you wear is in some way connected to this, to, to, to this, to this story. However, I still think it is important and empowering to make decisions about that, those everyday, yeah, those everyday decisions. So, so as I said, that there are these artists exploring techniques. There's also Mary Mattingly, who um, whose work um, elements from my camera. She's she's exploring the rare earth elements that are used in in photography. So, so I think that you know, there's artists exploring those areas as well as artists who are you know making work about. Um, you know, um, all sorts of things to do with ecological um, problems. Um, you okay there, Alana? Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> you you can tell that I'm 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 a technological <laughs> luddite. Um, has, no, but I think we should. We I want to look at some of the work as well. But um, I suppose it's tricky, isn't it? Because you know, we all feel like hypocrites um, within what we're doing. You know, you make work about environmentalism to some degree but then you print a photograph you get it framed you put it in a gallery and there is a difficulty with that then what is it you know waste all the waste that's produced around your work um, and so I think that it's really important to think about that and perhaps sometimes to realize that you make work you make decisions around you know the production of the work but you can also put your energy elsewhere you can you know be going on marches you can be giving money to different organizations. There's many ways in which you engage, um, it, you know, in the environmental questions, I think. Thank you. There's so much work here. I do want to just talk a little bit about your future body of work, Chloe, because this is an opportunity for it to have a kind of, maybe a world premiere, perhaps. <laughs> um, so this is a body of work from my, called Plantation Scape, right? Is that? It's called Plantation. Plantation. Yeah. Um, and this is a kind of a, a commission from the FRAC Aquitaine looking at, um, well, Chloe was invited to respond to the kind of ecological landscape, the environmental landscape, cultural landscape of the Bordeaux area of the, of the Département de l'Aquitaine. Um, and is telling this incredible story about, you know, because it's also about questions of erasure and silencing. Um, and I wonder whether you can just tell us a little bit about what's happening in this body of work. Yeah, so this is um, a body of work made in the Land area. This is a short excerpt. Oh, no, maybe these are just stills, I think, actually. So you can see from the, um, from the old archive photographs created by um, Félix Arnaudin, who was an extraordinary um, photographer in the late 19th century, um, who was recording this marshland, one of the most kind of... Um, you know, it really, really um, impoverished soil. Nothing would grow unless you brought sheep wandering around to poo on the soil, which then made it um, fertile enough just to um, make enough food for, for one to eat. So it's in a very, very poor area of France until it was... And, and so you see these extraordinary photographs of um, these shepherds on stilts. They used to wander around. The stilt was used 
it was almost like an early form of surveillance. It was a way to be up high, survey the sheep, which, as I said, were moving very quickly around these areas because such large areas of marshland. And then it was realized, you know, um, around Napoleonic time that, um, in fact, this earth would um, sustain pines. So maritime pines were planted in huge areas. So the, so the landscape or the land was enclosed and was privatized from having been common land, became privatized land, where now it's the biggest um, production forest in the whole of Europe. So it's a completely industrialized landscape. Maritime pa um, pines, rows and rows um, of, of um, woodlands that are used for paper, cardboard, pallets, all sorts of things. And um, I just yeah. want to interject because, you know, I th you've said some really kind of the important things there, which is around the privatization of our common land. This is land that belonged to us as a community, as a kind of, as, as, a, as a people that has been sequestered, contained for capitalist purposes, you know, and, 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 and it, it happens everywhere in the UK. While I was researching the show, I discovered that only 8% of the British landscape is open to the public. Greenham Common, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Greenham Common, but it was a common, it is in the name. It was an area of land that was sequestered by the military in order to locate and situate um, nuclear missiles at the height of the Cold War in the early 80s. But, but it has a very long history. It has a history since the kind of media, all the kind of since early capitalism and primitive accumulation. And what does it mean to how we engage, you know, because our history with the landscape, and this is what ecofeminism is really trying to unpick and unravel, is that it's, it, it's not something that's new. And the show, and I think it's also important just to say here that ecofeminism is not thinking through climate change. Climate change is one part of a bigger story. It's a relationship to our land, whether it's a, through the body, through the mind, through many different ways. Um, but it starts very early on, and it in was incremental. We didn't even realize it was happening. And it, you know, it, it, it caused vagabondage. It caused people to lose their ways of survival. Hence how capitalism began to really kind of very quickly accelerate. And I think it's amazing to see this work here and to see these shepherds on these stilts when the land was still available for foraging. It would belong to all of us. There's an incredibly liberatory, emancipatory aspect to that. And we need to find a way to get that back, how to, to reclaim that land. I know that's very idealistic, but that really is... I think kind of the purpose of thinking through these ideas is once you recognize that it's happening, you can begin to resist and argue for it to be, to, to, you know, the butter, to be transformed or to kind of go back. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of raise that as an idea. Yeah, and, and I think that what comes with, as you say, the kind of capitalist um, need for making money is then this, you know, a monoculture is created so that the sort of ecological repercussions of, of that, kind of um, search always for monetizing a landscape is that it becomes a monoculture and stripped of its biodiversity, which then leads in this area to, you know, increased wildfires and so on. You know, as we know, it's the, there's a sort of snowballing effect that happens. Um, and so, yeah, in this series, you can actually see um, nowadays the only place that the, the sheep can can graze is within within these strange solar farms, which they now use the sheep almost as a slightly sort of greenwashy thing to say, oh, here we are with our wonderful solar farms, and there's even such a kind of natural environment we have these sheep wandering through, which in fact is totally constructed and 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 you know um, used, I suppose, as as a sort of communications um, uh, ploy, really. Yeah, brilliant. It's, I think when almost running out of time we could go on but maybe we can have that first of all thank you for being so incredibly articulate and generous with your thoughts with your time with your work there's a lot more work we could talk about um but maybe we should open it up to the audience and see if there are any questions anyone would like to ask questions surely No, oh, well then I, I get to speak some more. You've got a question. Yeah, um, Lomi, what is your next uh, big project that you're working on? Uh, thanks, Karen. 
Well, I've got these like never ending like projects. They just like uh, keep evolving and like going and going and going. So I'm currently working on a book for Blood Speaks, uh, which is going to bring the entire world of. Uh, for those of you who don't know, maybe we can just play the trailer. Is there sound here, please? Thank you. Can we have sound? Just pause it. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I have three buttons. Welcome Oops. to London. Okay, just pause it. Just pause a it. Place where shame and fear grow. Just start strong. it again. Yeah. Um, so I have. I'm working on a book next, and. Um, and films, so I am. Um, I just gave birth to a new VR piece that I premiered at Tribeca Film Festival, and uh, that's now going to travel and uh, and become a 2D uh, film as well. And it also has a, a massive photography and um, a, a activist sort of um, ten year, pro eleven year project. Uh, uh, behind it, it ended changing laws about uh, uh, physical impositions of control on women who menstruate or go through uh, postpartum bleeding. But then it's more about that, It's the story is more about the awakening of a woman's sexuality and self-discovery. And kind of getting inspired from Audre Lorde, it kind of uses and makes you understand what are your what are women's subversive erotic powers because we all have it, we've all had it in different cultures. It's about unlocking, you know, your serpent, your Kundalini in yoga. Audre Lorde called it the spiritual plane. You know, it's about how the mystical inside and the outside um, match. And the VR is a, 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 so a, is a psychological thriller and. Um, and a superhero satire about a woman from South Asia who gets um, uh, who gets uh, magical powers from a menstruation and then goes on adventure in the West. So to uh, ha break down misogyny and violence. So it kind of subverts and decolonizes the superhero genre. But it also, in the end, you find out there is. I, I don't want to say it. You should watch it. But it's it's. So you don't have to watch. You have to experience it. I have experienced yeah, it's it. It's completely it's sensational. It's completely hand tracked, and you become an agent in the work. So it's like you are shaping uh, your own journey, and like you're surrounded in a world of shame and taboo. And I'll give one clue: you literally have to grab a tampon to move ahead the piece. So it's very <laughs> confrontational and it's very subversive. It's somewhere between art, film, and a game. Um, can, can I ask, actually, Polymy, which is something that we haven't asked, because, you know, here we are in Paris. Um, and it's and completely hand-created. Your work in... Do you show your work in India? How was it received? Um, so I have to say that uh, I haven't been able to show Centralia or Fireflies is like a no-go situation because it's so subversive and political that I don't really get a space and also... I don't really know. I don't think I'm very uh, interesting to them or what. I don't know. But I did just have a show for the Olympic Museum, actually, in Bombay and Delhi. So I feel like, I don't know, it's, it's like, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I'm walking and straddling like many different uh, contemporary art lines and things. I don't know, maybe because it's very elite and male still, I feel maybe they find me threatening. Maybe they are like, it's difficult for them to put these shows and not get shut down, you know. It's also a very fascist government. So, I mean, especially with Fireflies, which involves my mother and my bodies in such a profound way, you know. I mean, it is, no one's going to show it, like, you know. So, Yeah. There you go. Thank but I you. have shown works in the villages of Nepal and like villages like where women have come and seen them and we've done activations like, you know, so I don't know. Yeah. They need to see your work. I mean, I mean, I guess it's in some ways you're like, do you still tell the people the same stories that like they already know? Because some of my work is really about sort of, it's, it's putting people, it's putting in uh, work in, in front of people who are policy shapers and like, elites and like first world people in many ways because their repercussions are being felt by us you know so in a way my audience is in the west you know in many ways you know the work i do 
in South Asia is more like groundswell, more like sort of, you know, working with uh, people on the ground. And it's a very different kind of work I do there because I feel that's needed. You know, I can't take this work back to the people in the women in the forest and be like, they know what their story is. But it's, it, it, you have to know who your audience is. I mean, you make art for yourself, you know, but there is that interior and exterior sort of that it's got to match. And like, in some ways, you know, it has to mirror each other, like, you know, so that, you know, I mean, sometimes work about yourself tells you a lot about the world you're living in. And sometimes, you know, it's the other way around. So, so coming back to your question, Karen, sorry, I have a book coming out next year and I've got a bunch of films coming out and God knows. Ptolemy is things. nothing if not prolific, always. Right? Can I ask <laughs> you a question? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Well, I was wondering, you were saying that ecofeminism was very um, unfashionable in the 70s, 80s. Was it yes. 70s, 80s? Yes. So I wondered, making um, resistors now, how the response has been, and if you think it's a different kind of context and environment to put out a lot of the work that was unpopular at that time. Yes, I mean, absolutely. We're living in a completely different context and, and we can make the show now because A, there is a resurgence of interest and a revival of interest. And I think it's partly because we are living in a world that recognizes intersectionality. Um, it's not to say that we're living in a perfect world, but we are living in a world, you know, where, where you know, gender justice is something that is much more spoken about, but also kind of decolonial um, conversations and discourse, you know, because the, the, the problem with ecofeminism, uh, uh, we're just living in such a different world that the, the, the fears and the anxieties that feminists had around the kind of theorization of ecofeminism and, and the relationship to the bodily was so very different. You know, the, the 70s and 80s was still, you know, if I, you know, big back reading around it, you know, and reminding ourselves of what that was like. It was an incredibly, you know, you know, the first wave fem or second wave feminism in the late 60s and 70s, they were really still just struggling. They were, you know, so we've, we've come such a long way. And, and, and again, you know, the ecological crisis um, again, has kind of, you know, gone up the kind of the, the, the ladder of priorities. But just to say that there were artists making work that was deeply eco-feminist in the 70s. They just didn't get to show that work. Yes, because everybody wants to show, like, uh, works of women or, like, people of color when they're no longer a threat to white supremacy, right? When they're dead and gone or, like, very old, like, whatever. So, but I guess... These things were coming onto this. I mean, there was a lot of work being done in the southern regions, you know, whether that's like in Latin America or India. Um, but I mean, there was a lot of like still you could hear about these terms and these buzzwords in the uh, in the western regions because I guess because of a lot of white feminism that was happening at the time. But also white feminism, we cannot just see it through a gendered lens because it also has power. Of, you know? of course. Like, that is something we should talk about. Because, ab absolutely. Yeah. So my question to you, Alona, is how do you think we can, like, you know, uh, sort of uh, move museums into a more sort of a space of, uh, say, a decolonial uh, sort of ecology sort of a space, but also how do we push that sort of whiteness, like the empire out of the museum spaces? Like how do we then make it a museum, a space of joyful militancy? How do we do that? <laughs> if I knew I'd be the director of a museum, Polymy. No, we need to keep fighting and to keep resisting and we have a civic responsibility. You know, I believe that very strongly. And, and, and so it is on, a, um, the responsibility is on the institution to educate themselves, to change, to bring in different voices, a multiplicity of identities, to have boards, to pay people better. It's about economies as well. It's about how we value culture. There are so many factors. You have the institution itself and the systemic injustices that are embedded within those, whether it's collecting practices, curators. There are so many things that need to change. And in fact, I think the change is happening in temporary exhibitions and not in collection building. Um, that needs to change. There's a lot of work to do, Paul and me, but we need to start somewhere. So, and on that note, maybe we should uh, bring the conversation to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you to Chloe and Paul and me for sharing. That was intense. That was intense. Thanks for sitting through. <laughs>